Good morning. Welcome to worship. Did you all feel a little bit rested after an extra hour of sleep, or did you not even notice? <laughs> kind of the way it is these days, right? Let's see here. Here we go. Well, today is All Saints Day here at Creator Lutheran Church, so we remember later in the service those who have died either this last year or that are still, um, well, they're always still in our hearts, correct? but that we want to lift up once again today. If we by chance don't have the name of somebody that's in your heart today, um, I'll give a space for just you to say those names as well um, when we get to that point. Today is our last Lord's Prayer class. We're going to talk about temptation and evil. So if you want to talk about temptation and evil, join me in between services in the, the, social, the, the multi-purpose room. Um, we will have next Sunday our budget Q&A between services in the narthex, and then the 21st of November will be our congregational meeting to talk about and, um, and vote for our 2022 budget. So that will be between services, and that will be a hybrid. Um, so we will have in-person and also on Zoom for that congregational meeting. November 14th as well, um, the education hour will be led by, by Ron, and it will be talking discussion based, a follow up conversation based on the, the PLU lecture on Bonhoeffer, the church and climate question. So you're welcome to come to that. Um, Ron will be leading the discussion. Also next week, and this, next week's a big week, I will not be here. So Bishop Jake will be covering the, for the worship service because at the second service, we will be installing the Alive board of the, um, our Synod youth. So they will be here second service for that. So we'll be live streaming both of the services next week so that because that will only be installation at the second service. Um, as you'll see out in the narthex, there's a lot of things starting to happen. We have our directories ready for you to pick up. There, your name should be on them. If you do not find one with your name on it, let us know, and we can find a, a blank copy to, for you to take home as well. Christmas wreaths are happening, so start to get those ready so we can get um, kits prepared. Once again, we'll do that virtually. It's just one of those activities where we're too close together for too long to, st to kind of move into in-person. That's a, a next-year goal. Bunko sign-up is there. Kim will be out there as well to sign you up for Bunko that's coming up. Um, worship services are out there as well. And it's Apple Cup coming up. So we will have, there's two boxes out there, and there's also envelopes in the back of chairs if you'd like to um, support our food banks in that way. Um, if you're a visitor to Creator, welcome. We give thanks to God that you are here. Um, and I think that's all the announcements for the day. Um, if I forgot anything, please let me know, and I'll make sure we get an email to you or something um, as well. And so let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Please rise. We worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. One God who is teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love your neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have fallen short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, I declare that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. We'll continue with our Kyrie.
Almighty God, you have knit your people together in one first reading is from the book of Isaiah, the 25th chapter. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a rich feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his peoples he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Second reading is from Revelation, the second chapter. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the work of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite any kids that are with us today to come forward for a children's sermon. Come on up. Hello, Joy and Joaquin and Eliana. Welcome. You're welcome to sit in, in, on the chairs or here in front, whatever you're more comfortable at, okay? I'm glad you're here today. Okay. Well, today is a special day in the church called All Saints Day. It's a day that we remember people that we miss, people that maybe have died or that we don't see. Yeah, that's what we're talking about today. So we're going to say their names later, but I have a book today that talks a little bit about leaves. Have we been seeing leaves falling down a lot outside? It's like it's that time of year, right? And what colors are those leaves? Orange. Orange, yellow, and red. And even some green ones fall down, right? In my yard, it's a lot of pine needles that have been falling down. So this is a story called The Fall of Freddy the Leaf. So as I read it, you can think of all the leaves, or you can see the leaves over there too, okay? Spring had passed, so had summer. Freddy the Leaf had grown large. His midsection was wide and strong, and his five extensions, like a maple leaf, were firm and pointed. He had first appeared in spring, a small sprout. Like, you remember how spring works, right? They're really small. It's fun to see those first buds come up. 
large near the branch of the tall tree. Freddie was surrounded by hundreds of other leaves, just like himself, or so it seemed. Soon he discovered that no two leaves were alike, even though they were on the same tree. Have you noticed that? That not any leaves are the same as any other leaves, just like us. Here, I'm going to fix my microphone. Sorry. Masks can get complicated, can't they? Thank you for your patience. Alfred was the leaf next to him. Do you think leaves actually have names? We can pretend, though, can't we? Ben was the leaf on his right side, and Claire was the lovely leaf overhead. They had all grown up together, and they had learned to dance in the spring breezes, bask lazily in the summer sun, and wash off the cooling rains. See, they're all growing. It's like the summertime, right? But it was Daniel who was Freddie's best friend. He was the largest leaf on the limb and seemed to have been there before anyone else. It appeared to Freddie that Daniel was also the wisest among them. It was Daniel who told them that they were part of a tree. It was Daniel who explained that they were growing in a public park. It was Daniel who told them that the tree had strong roots, which were hidden in the ground below. He explained about the birds who came to sit on their branch and sing morning songs. He explained about the sun and the moon and the stars and the seasons. All those sorts of things. Look at Eliana. Look at the picture. Freddie loved being a leaf. He loved his branch, his light leafy friends, his high place in the sky, the wind that jostled him about, the sun rays that warmed him, the moon that covered him with soft white shadows. Summer had been especially nice. The long hot days felt good and the warm nights were peaceful and dreamy. There were many people in the park that summer. They often came and sat under Freddie's tree and Daniel told them that giving a shade was part of his purpose. What's a purpose, Freddie's had to ask. A reason for being, Daniel had answered. To make things more pleasant for others in a, is a reason for being. To make shade for old people who come to escape the heat in their homes is a reason for being. To provide a cool place for children to come and play. To fan our leaves and the pic picnickers who come to eat on checkered tablecloths. These are all reasons for being. Freddie especially liked the old people. They sat so quietly on the cool grass and hardly ever moved. They talked with, in whispers of times past. The children were fun too, even though that they sometimes tore holes in the bark of the tree or carved their names into it. Still, it was fun to watch them move so fast and to laugh so much. But Freddie's summer soon passed. It vanished on an October night. He had never felt so cold. All the leaves shivered with cold. They were coated with a thin layer of white, which quickly melted and left them. What do you think that white was? Snow. Probably snow. Good point. Which quickly melted and left them dew-drenched dew and sparkling in the morning sun. Again, it was Daniel who explained that they had experienced their first frost, the sign that it was fall and that winter would soon come. Almost at once, the whole tree, in fact, the whole park was transformed into a blaze of color, just like we have right now outside, right? Look at Eliana. Aren't they pretty? There was hardly a green leaf left. Alfred had turned deep yellow. Ben had turned bright orange. Claire had was a blazing red. Daniel a deep purple. And Freddie was red and gold and blue. However beautiful they all looked, Freddie and his friends had made their tree a rainbow. Why did we turn different colors, Freddie asked, when we are on the same tree? Well, each of us is different. We have had different experiences. We have had faced the sun differently. We had cast shade differently. Why would we not have different colors? Daniel was said matter-of-factly. Daniel told Freddie that this wonderful season was called, what do you think? Fall. Fall. Yep. One day, a very strange thing happened. The same breezes that in the past had made them dance began to push and pull at their stems, almost as if they were angry. This caused some of the leaves to be torn from their branches and swept up in the wind, tossed about and dropped softly to the ground. All the leaves became frightened. What's happening, they asked each other in whispers. This is what happens in fall, Daniel told them. It's the time for leaves to change their home. Some people call it to die. Will we all die, Freddie asked. Yes, Daniel said. 
everything dies. No matter how big or small, how weak or strong, we first do our job. We experience the sun and the moon, the wind and the rain. We learn to dance and to laugh, and then we die. I won't die, said Freddy with determination. Will you, Daniel? Yes, answered Daniel, when it's my time. When is that, asked Freddy. No one knows for sure, Daniel responded. Freddy noticed that the other leaves continued to fall. He thought, it must be their time. He saw that some of the leaves lashed back at the wind before they fell. Others simply let go and dropped quietly. Soon the tree was almost bare. I'm afraid to die, Freddy told Daniel. I don't know what's down there. We all fear what we don't know, Freddy. It's natural, Daniel reassured him. Yet you are not afraid when spring became summer. You are not afraid when summer became fall. They are natural changes. Why should we be afraid of the season of death? Does the tree die too, Freddy asked? Someday, but there is something stronger than the life, the tree. It is life that lasts forever and we are all part of life. Where will we go when we die? Will we return in the spring? We will not know, but life will. We may not, but life will. Then what, will, what has been the reason for all of this, Freddie continued to question. Why were we here at all if we were only to have to fall and die? Daniel answered in his matter-of-fact way. It's, about, it's been about the sun and the moon. It's been about happy times together. It's been about shade and the, and the old people and the children. It's been about colors in fall. It's been about season. Isn't that enough? That afternoon in the golden light... Where's the golden light? Daniel let go. He fell effort, effortlessly. He seemed to, uh, to smile peacefully as he fell. Goodbye for now, Freddy, he said. Then Freddy was alone, the only leaf left on the branch. Have you ever been the, seen one, a tree with only one leaf on it? We can look for that right now, right? They're starting to fall down a lot. So look out for those trees that are falling, that leaves that are falling. Did you? you said, did it fall on your car? What color was it? Um, orange. orange. Yep. So we're seeing this happen right now. All the tree. Can you imagine that they're all letting go? The first snow fell that f following morning. It was soft and white and gentle, but it was bitter cold. There was hardly any sun that day, and the day and the day was very short. Freddie found himself losing his color, becoming brittle. It was constantly cold, and the snow weighed heavily upon him. At dawn, the wind came that took Freddy from the branch. It didn't hurt at all. He felt himself float, float quietly, gently, and softly downward. As he fell, he saw the whole tree for the first time, how strong and firm it was. See the tree without all the leaves? All that life that still happens, even though it's changed. That's snow. That is snow. Is there snow? There's not snow right now outside, is there? Yeah. But uh, right now in the mountain passes, there's snow, isn't there? Yeah. Do you like snow? Do you like playing in snow? Yes. Yeah, I do too. Drilling snowmen's my favorite too. There's all sorts of fun things to do in winter. He was sure that he would live for a long time and he knew that he had been part of its life, the, tr the tree's life, and it made him proud. Freddie landed on a clump of snow. It somehow felt soft and even warm. In this new position, he was more comfortable than he had ever been. He closed his eyes and fell asleep. He did not know that spring would follow winter and that snow would melt into water. He did not know that what, what appeared to be his useless dried self would join with the water and serve to make the tree stronger. Most of all, he did not know that there, asleep on the tree of the ground, there were already plans for new leaves in the spring. There's a cycle in life, isn't there? We see it in nature all the time. Where in spring there's new life, and then in summer we enjoy that life, and fall things change, and then in winter the leaves fall down, don't they? And the tree, and they, they die, and the tree goes into to sleep. Well, in our life in Christ, that happens too. We, have, we are born, and we live our life, and then one day, we too, like the leaves, will die. But we have a promise because of Jesus that there's new life too, that there's hope and there's heaven and there's God being with us, picking us up and making us feel safe and comfortable. So I have this book and I have other books also that if you ever have any questions about that, because it's something that ev happens to everybody and it's something that we can talk about at church. We can talk about hard things at church 
and have that comfort that God loves us and that there's new life in the spring. So right now, I want you to look at all the leaves over there. They say things like love and serving and prayer and healing and passion and today and father and sharing and giving and health and hope and salvation and peace. All of those leaves are part of who we are as a church too. And we'll, the, in the spring, we put... They're all different colors. And like, just like fall, you are very observant. Because in the spring, guess what? We put new ones on there that are all green and they have different words on them. So you can start thinking about what all of those words mean and that's part of our purposes. Our purpose as a church, our purpose as people here is to be in community and to be um, hopeful and to help and to forgive and to say, Alleluia! Those are all parts of being in church. So as you see the leaves fall, I want you to remember all the different parts of life and that all of them are important to God and all of them are part of who we are. So let us pray. Put your hands together. Dear Jesus, thank you for being part of every part of our lives, for giving us new life, for being with us as we enjoy that life and to help us when we're sick and we're sad and when our life comes to an end, that we know that in you there is new life, resurrection, and joy forever with you. Help us to be the congregation you would have us be and the little leaves out there that um, add so much to our beautiful life together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may return to your seats. Amen. You are the best prayer, Elian. Please rise for our gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel today comes from John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt before his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In our course of this Lord's Prayer class, we've been talking about daily bread. And when we think about today, we'll remember the saints that have gone before us. 
one thing that we remember is that God indeed does provide everything that we need for life, including the people that we mourn. They were part of that daily gift of daily bread for us. And so as we grieve their loss and their death, we grieve that they were part of our lives, someone who was that daily bread for us, meeting our needs, and they're no longer there to do that. They're no longer there to leave their coffee cup every single place that you don't want it to be or have their clothes strewn about the room. They're no longer there to provide a listening ear. They're no longer there to provide laughter and dancing and that joy in the middle of the day, in the middle of the night. But the daily bread that they were remains. Now often we try, when we look at somebody's life, to saint the person. Not because, in, in a way that we try to celebrate their life and elevate them to sainthood, to be comfortable in who and where they will be and in their eternal rest because they were good enough and they did what was needed in order to achieve salvation from God. And that's not the promise that we have. We are not saints because we are good. In truth, we are fully made what God has called us to be, and we are taught that it is God alone that gives us that word of new life, that salvation. Because the flip side is then if somebody was a sinful person, if somebody did fall short, then where would they be? If it was all on us, it was all that that pain and of all that responsibility was on our shoulders, we would be most to be pitied in that moment of death. The good news is that in death, we are no longer able to sin. We are no longer adding on to the list of places we have hurt and ways we have fallen short. And we are moved from the sinful and broken world that is filled with suffering and pain, including our own. So how do we hold this tension as a people of God? That people were our daily bread, that they were a gift from God, and yet we are a sinful world who falls short, and we suffer and we die. Because we often in our world are taught to live our lives from life to death. But as Christians, we are taught to live from death to life, from old to new, from saint to sinner both in this life forward from baptism and into the next where we do receive that promise, rest in peace. But there's another piece to consider today in our lessons, the accusation of the law. Because in death, the next word that we hear is not, you didn't do well enough, or I judge you, but it's Christ's word in our ear that says, I am waking you up to eternal life. Isaiah talks about this great banquet where God will gather all people to a feast, where joy and celebration at being gathered will be celebrated and enjoyed because something powerful that covers and shadows everyone's life has been destroyed. So much of our lives are spent in the shadow of death, wrapped in our fear that we re fear of death, that we react. Shrouded in grief, we deny or we despair. We fight, we run, we try to cheat death, we resist death. We spend so much of our life focusing on death. We cannot escape, can we? That shadow. The shroud comes over all of us. All nations, all people die. And when we do, the daily bread that God give, gave others through us stops as well. Rivers of te tears are given, and expanding shadows come and conquer us, or so it seems. But there is hope, hope for the banquet, hope for being gathered, and a promise seemingly impossible that God will swallow up death, that God will wipe away our tears, that God will save us. But Isaiah throws in this other word in the midst of all these promises, one that is harder to celebrate and causes us to trip up, 
to doubt and to listen to the drumbeat of the law accusing us and driving us to accuse God about why these things happen to us. And that a word that Isaiah adds is wait. But uh, when you think about it, when we wait, when we are forced to wait, we wonder, don't we? We fall into unbelief. Our senses fill up with data of all the things that are going wrong or could go wrong, and they shake our trust. We shrink, and we stink things up, and we muddle the waters, and we grasp at anything that might be hopeful. We pull the shroud of death over ourselves, and we die while we're still living. God knows that you fear death. John, in the, sixth, in the sixth and last of his greatest of his signs, shows us what Jesus thinks about death and does about death. He conquers it. So in our gospel reading from John today, we, a little background. It's a story we know, but it's not bad to remind ourselves. Lazarus was sick, just like many of us have been sick just like many of our loved ones have been sick. And the word was sent to Jesus to come. And Jesus waits. He was not there to help Lazarus avoid death because he had become incarnate to usher us through death. And at this time, God wants us to know that. So Mary, Lazarus' sister, accuses Jesus of not giving her what she wanted. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We are so quick to cast blame. And not only her, Jesus looked around and saw others weeping and grieving Lazarus' death. And then something surprising happens. We could say that, as we heard today, that Jesus was disturbed in spirit and deeply moved, that he even weeps. This is comforting in Christ's compassion. We can receive that comfort. I have read this text most of my life this way and grasped onto it as a way forward in my grief most of my life. I know that Christ cares when we are in pain and when we suffer and we die. That is not something we're debating I know that Christ understands fully hum- understands because he is fully human. He knows the shroud of life and the shadow of fear that stalks each and every one of us. I like the thought of his empathy, his tears, that Lazarus died, his solidarity, his moving, moving him to go to where Lazarus is entombed. I like that. It's comfortable. But that solidarity isn't enough for me anymore. It isn't enough for you either. Because God goes beyond solidarity and gives us salvation, which is much more than solidarity. It would be parallel to our current criticism of my thoughts and prayers are with you. Is that enough? Really? Cry and move on, unable to do more for you. Do we want a Savior who is unable to do more for us? You see, that is the key. Jesus is able to do more. In fact, he came to us in order to do more. Really good news, lost on us if we settle for the comfort of solidarity. You see, we are often read that he is so disturbed and deeply moved. In reality, we should be reading it this way, if we're honest with what the original writers intended, that Jesus was angry that day. He was frustrated to his core. He was not a co-weeper that day or a co-sufferer with Mary and Martha. He was frustrated with the crowd and their unbelief. And he has had it with the fact that the wages of sin is death. Even the crowd that day didn't get it. They were stuck. They were wrapped and trapped in the shroud of death, which we have all been taught to be. And then when they learned 
And then what, how we learn that death is all-powerful and final. That's what we're taught, right? The crowd draws false comfort as well from Jesus' tears, just like we often do. Oh, how he loved him. They had already moved on with Jesus' trial when he did not show up on time, and they had to wait. They had had to watch Lazarus die. They had had to lay him in the tomb, wrapped in the inescapable, unconquerable shroud of death. They had had to wait, and their friend died. Either Jesus did not love, or he had no power. Because if he had loved, he would not have prevented us from experiencing death. This is the trial we put Jesus on all the time. They don't believe Jesus can do, will do anything in the face of this last enemy. We're there too, aren't we? With the crowd. God, why did you take them? Why didn't you stop this from happening? Don't you love me? Don't you love them? Don't you love us? That's why we've also taken out of our funeral liturgy the line from Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the Lord. It's too uncomfortable. We would rather Jesus had no power over our situation and suffering than not get what we want. We get stuck in the lament of if only. We are frustrated that God does not heed what we want, but does give what we need. As they approach the tomb, and Jesus asks for the, the stone to be rolled a day away, Martha gets nervous. Lord, it's going to stink. He's been dead for four days. Jesus is not concerned with Lazarus's stench. In death, we can sin no more. We simply return to dust, fulfilling the promise buried in the fall of Genesis 3. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. I've never thought of that as a promise before, but it is. Lazarus has nothing to add to this. He has nothing to contribute anymore. He has nothing to argue against. He has nothing to doubt. Martha and the crowd, however, do stink. The stench of unbelief, of sin, of despair is pouring out of them. Here we hear why Jesus was angry with them. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they roll the stone away, and Jesus makes life with his words once again. Lazarus did not decide, did not consider, or think about whether to listen or not. Jesus spoke him into life, into existence, and all the markings and the trappings and the wraps of death fell off of him. No longer bound, he was freed. We live life afraid of death. We are all marked by death. When someone dies, we want to know if it was their fault. Did they wear a seatbelt? Did they smoke? Did they take the proper precautions? Were they vaccinated? We want to know the cause so that we can control and we can let it go. So that we can avoid that fear. But what this does is bind us tighter and cover us more completely in that fear. Christ is angry about our unbelief. Christ knows that the wages and the consequences of our sin is death. But today, as we name the beloved ones who God gave to us as gifts, as our daily bread, meeting our needs and enriching our lives, we can trust two things. One, well, three things. <laughs> Salvation is so much more than solidarity. The promise of awakening in heavenly glory to Christ calling us to resurrected life for God's wrath and anger leads to an act of mercy and salvation by God. The last thing we know in Christ is mercy. And that today God unwraps you from the bands of death that surround your life and your focus on fear with us in the shadow God is. But more importantly, God saves us from the shadow, giving us belief and promise 
that we are bound in sin and death, and that God calls us by name. Right now, you are called and you are known. And again, when you need to hear that again and again and again. And when we are called by name, we come out of our tombs and we live feasting on the daily bread that God gives us each and every day until that last time when we will awaken into God's glory. As God says, come out, you are freed. Amen. You may be seated. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism unto death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Amen. These saints, recalled by Creator's Faith Community, who have joined the church triumphant, are remembered as the bell tolls. Enjoy because of Christ's Jesus' triumph over death. Jesse Beringer, Renee Carney, Ken Koffel, Anna Demkowski, D. Daring, Isabella Daring, Russ Daring, Linda Dotson. John Eske, Lorraine Eske, Bill Ellis, Dorothy Gano, Janice Harler, 
Judy Hewitt. Lonzel Johnson. Jean Kraus. Arlene Lawson. Ken Matson. Shirley McKean. Philip Meyer. Lisa Morgan. Jack Nevlet. Bradley Nelson. William Rowan. Betty Schneidelman. Nancy Thorpe. Eloise Torlet. Eleanor Valenta. Sharon Westman. Merritt Winchell. Other names that you'd like to lift before us now? Let us pray. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for freeing all your sons and daughters from the power of sin and death and for raising us up to new life. Bless the saints, both living and dead, and bring us all to the full joy of your saving grace in Jesus Christ. Grant us by your grace and peace as we follow in faith where you have led the way. At length, may we fall asleep peacefully in the wake into your likeness. To you, the author and giver of all life, be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Please rise.
So as we have, we're going to start transitioning back to uh, hopefully in the next week or two to passing the offering plate. But until we do that, it's in the back over there. And you, as you leave or as you come, you may leave your offering there, but also the Give Plus app or our website or good old put a stamp on a, in an envelope and send it in and that still gets us here as well. What this helps is the ministry and mission that God has placed in our hands as we are church together and as we are faithful in all of those commitments. So thank you for your generosity and let us jo- let's rise and join together Oh, sorry, we have an offertory. Let's sing and sing our offertory together. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain down from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. In the blessedness of your saints, you have given us a glorious pledge of the hope of our calling, that moved by their witness and supported by their fellowship, we may run with perseverance the race that is set before us and with them receive the unfading crown of glory. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the communion assistants to fo come forward. And as, as, after we commune, the ushers will also invite you forward to two stations up in front where you'll be given bread and then may take either wine or grape juice. And you're welcome to kneel at the altar in prayer or return to your seats to pray, or pray there. All who hunger and thirst come. The table is ready.
People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.